Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, our Heavenly Father. We thank you for bringing us to this point, Lord. We thank you for bringing us together. We also praise you for just who you are and being holy and righteous. Lord, we thank you that you have made a way for us to come back to you, Lord God. And we just also would thank you for your Holy Spirit this morning who has been moving in hearts and lives from the very beginning, Lord. And I thank you for that. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Oh. <clears throat> so, uh, many people maybe expect to hear about another feast, but that was last year. We're moving into a new year. Uh, going to cover some new ground. But this year I am going to do a, a series based on the principle of looking at the life of Yeshua from a first century Jewish perspective. And if you don't know from the video and, and from what I've said, Yeshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus. And as we do that, I want to step back and think about what did the original reader think when he read the Gospels and he read the stories of Jesus? Or what may have been, been in the mind of the person that was going through the events of the Gospel stories? See, when we hear something, something automatically comes to mind in many cases. Like, if I make a reference to football, you know what that is. Or if I make a reference to baseball, you have guidelines to go with before I say anything else. You have some preconceived notions. Well, I want to go and see what some of those preconceived notions were of the people in the gospel stories and those that were reading them for the first time. You know, scholars will say that the Bible is written for us, but not to us. I don't know about you, but I'm very stubborn when it comes to new ideas. When I hear a new idea, my immediate answer is no, or I don't believe it. And then I have to do a lot of study to, to know for myself and truly know, is this true or did someone just make this up? When I first heard that, I didn't like it. But then as I really got to think about it, it's definitely written for us. You can read scripture and get so much just from a quick reading, even sometimes when you're in a, a time crunch. But it was also written, it was not written to us, it was written to the original reader. So when we can step back and put ourselves in their shoes, we can get a deeper understanding. And there's a fancy word for it called hermeneutics, but you don't have to worry about that. I like to explain it like this. The Bible is like an onion. The deeper we go, the sweeter it gets. And that surface level reading is very important to understand. But if you truly wanna get closer in your relationship to God, you've gotta take time and study in the word of God to know what he's saying for you at this point and let the Holy Spirit bring that deeper meaning to you specifically. So first I wanna look at the Bible. So how was it written? And for that I go to scripture. John 17, 17 says, as Jesus is pre, uh, praying his high priestly prayer about us here in the church age, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. And that just really hits me that the word of God is truth, both written and spoken and Jesus, because he's called the word in John chapter one, as he walked this earth, it is all truth. Another passage is 2 Timothy 3.16, which reads, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for re correction, for training in righteousness. There's a lot going on in that passage, but I just want to focus on the first part, that all scripture is inspired by God. Divine inspiration. You know, what comes to mind when you think of the Bible being inspired by God. Now, several people have this notion that the gospel writers and writers of the Bible are just walking along, enjoying their day, and God zaps them. And they find a scroll, and they find a pen, and their hand just starts moving. And they don't know what they're writing. And they're just writing and writing. And then at the end, they're like, wow, what did I write? And they go back and read it. And they think, huh, that's pretty good. I don't even understand half of what I wrote. But this is not a good and a good way to think of the scriptures being written. You know, God chose the men who would write scripture long before they wrote it. And I believe that he led them through certain events in their lives to prepare them 
for that moment. I want to look at a couple of, of writers of Scripture to make this example or to help you understand better. One is Moses. Sometimes Moses, or sometimes the Lord would say to Moses, write these words, and he would write them. Other times, I think just inspired through the Holy Spirit, he would just start writing. Certain parts, like about the Exodus story, when he wrote that they walked through on dry ground, he didn't have to have the Holy Spirit make his hand move to say that. He experienced it. He walked through on the dry ground himself. He knew about that. Many other things that that Moses wrote about. He was a firsthand eyewitness to these things. And he was able to portray it in a way for those guys back then to understand it, all the way for us today to understand what he was writing about. Now, another person that wrote scripture is Dr. Luke. So I wanna read what he says about himself in the way that he wrote it in Luke chapter one, verse three says, it seems fitting For me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. Now, Theophilus is the person he's writing this letter to. First century, most likely Roman. So if we can get a little bit into the Roman mindset of what was happening in the government and culture, we may can can glean some deeper meanings out of Luke's writing. He also makes an interesting statement that it's in consecutive order. Now, he is the only gospel writer that says he puts it in order. So if you're not sure about the order of what was going on in Jesus' life, I refer you to Dr. Luke because he's the one that says, I've put it in a, in a nice order for you to know what was happening when. Of course, the other gospel writers may have added more detail that Luke didn't, because remember, John says that if everything was written that Jesus did here on earth, the world could not contain the books. So they had to be selective in what they were writing to get their specific point across. And I would also like to say that when God calls us to do anything, as he called Luke here to do this, to write the gospel, he expects us to do work. And I refer you back to the first time God ever spoke to a human in scripture, which is Genesis 1:28. And this is Cody's translation. He told them, get to work. He told them, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth and rule over the animals. He didn't say, just walk out there, have fun, pick a piece of fruit when you want to. I'll see you in the cool of the evening. He said, no, I have a job for you to do. You're in relationship with me. I've created you for a certain purpose and a certain job. I want you to get to it. And that's how Luke takes on the experience of writing his gospel. Because he says, I investigated everything carefully. Now, what are some of the things Dr. Luke could have done to investigate? Well, we know that he was with Paul on Paul's missionary journeys. We also know that Paul had spent an extended period of time with the risen Messiah out in the desert. Uh, I think it's about three years. And I was thinking here in the United States, A master's degree usually takes about two years. So Paul has more than a master's degree in theology directly from the risen Lord himself. He was able to ask a lot of questions and therefore Luke was able to ask Paul questions. So maybe on things that Luke wasn't clear about, he had a firsthand witness to get those accounts from. Going with uh, Luke traveling with Paul, they also went down to Jerusalem. And Paul met with Peter, James, and John, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. So Luke is there with him. So very likely, as part of his investigation, he would talk to these people. So he can go to Peter and say, hey, Peter, what happened up on the Mount of Transfiguration? What did you see? Who did you see? Are all these other details that I'm hearing correct? And he got it from that firsthand witness. He can go to people like James, the brother of Jesus. And there, I think he can ask some really interesting questions. He can ask him, James, what was Messiah like during those teenage years when a lot of us go crazy? Or, hey, Jesus, or sorry, hey, James, did you ask Joseph, your dad, any questions about the the Messiah? Did you ask him about how Jesus's circumcision went? What other details can you give me about his life? 
Another interesting thing is remember that Mary was in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came down. So many scholars believe she stayed in Jerusalem as from the cross, Jesus gave charge of Mary to the apostle John. So as Luke writes, he writes some very interesting things about what Mary was thinking in her heart at certain times. Now, definitely the Holy Spirit could have inspired him to write those, but he also could have walked up to Mary and said, hey, Mary, What was going on in your head the night the Messiah was born? What did you see? What did you hear? And he could have gotten some details like that. And so I don't call Dr. Luke Dr. Luke only because he was a medical doctor. But I see the book of Luke and Acts as two dissertations, one on the life of Christ and one on the early church. Now, that brings me to how should we read the Bible today? Now, John Wesley in Sermon 74, speaking of the Bible, says, But it is a stated rule in interpreting Scripture never to depart from the plain, literal sense unless it, in, unless it implies an absurdity. Now, I agree with all this until we get to that word absurdity, because its definition is unreasonable. So there, if we each start reading scripture, I may think something's unreasonable, and you may think it's perfectly reasonable, or vice versa. This really came into the church from a man named Origen around 200 AD. And he started questioning, well, these things, it's not rational for these things to happen, so maybe they're just allegories. And many things have been put in this category over the years. And just a few of them are creation, because it's unreasonable for everything to come from nothing. Another is the virgin birth. It's not reasonable for her to have the baby. Another is Jesus being resurrected. It's not reasonable for a person to die and come back to life, so maybe he never really died, or maybe the resurrection was faked. But when we start to take the miraculous and say it doesn't happen because it's unreasonable, we've stripped the gospel from scripture. We've stripped everything that we're, we're asked to believe in for salvation. Now, uh, whenever I think about how to read scripture, I go back to that first verse I read in John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. So with looking at other, other people, how they read scripture and, and how they interpret it, I came up with a little sentence of my own of how I personally interpret scripture and says, when interpreting scripture, never depart from the plain literal sense unless it is implied otherwise in the text. So what I mean by that is, if I'm reading along and they say, this is a parable, well, I know it's a parable. Or John says, I see this beast coming up and it represents these things. Okay, that's a symbol. Other words as you're reading are very important, like the little words like and as. And I have an example in Matthew 17, 2. And this is speaking of Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. Okay, his his face did not become the sun, but it was as bright as the sun. And his garments were as white as light. Okay, he's not wearing light but that's what his clothes looked like. So we can see some things like that. Now, as we go through here, the first episode I would like to talk about in Jesus' life to try and go a little deeper and get a few layers under the surface is when the angel gave the names for Jesus and John to the parents. Now, Gabriel commands the names in both of these situations. He appears and tells them what to name the children. Now, in the first century Jewish mind, The people are thinking that mothers of the Old Testament, they're prophetesses. They would name the babies. We can see that from Scripture. Uh, Eve named the babies. Rachel, Rebecca, many other mothers are giving the names for the baby, except a few times when they're instructed what name to give the babies. And a lot of times, the reason they considered them prophetesses was because they would fulfill their name many of the times. So a gentleman had the idea, I'm going to take the names of the babies of the firstborn, 
I'm going to go Adam through Seth all the way to Noah. I'm going to see what their names mean. So he put it together in a sentence, and you can put that, the sentence up. The words in quotations were added to make it grammatically correct, but I'm going to read just the names of the babies. Man, appointed moral sorrow, the blessed God shall come down teaching, his death shall bring despairing rest. Now, now that we know more of the story, when we look back at these names, we can see the gospel message right there. Man is sinful. Jesus came down teaching. And the lost, he brought rest or salvation. So let's go back to John's name. And this will be in Luke chapter 1, 11 through 13. But let me give you a little bit of the background on this. So John's father is Zacharias. He is a common priest in the line of Abijah. And two weeks out of the year, his group would go to Jerusalem and serve in the temple. There are now there's one high priest, there's 24 chief priests, and each of these orders are under one of those priests. So it was time for Zechariah's order to go in and serve. There's many jobs at the temple, and the way that it was decided who would do what is by casting lots. And as they cast lots, Zacharias was chosen to burn the incense both morning and evening. Now how you would do that is you would take a coal off of the altar, walk into the holy place, put the coal, sprinkle the incense, it would burn, a sweet smelling aroma would go up and go in and fill the holy of holies. Now this is the exact same ceremony that the two sons of Aaron was performing in Leviticus chapter 10. As they went in, they brought in strange fire, and the Lord killed them for doing it improperly. So that story had kind of evolved over the years until we come to the first century when they thought that if you, did, if you were performing the ceremony and walked into the holy place, if you did anything wrong, an angel would appear, specifically on the right side of the altar of incense, and you would be killed. So let's read the account here. Okay, so uh, Zacharias walks into the holy place. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. Now, many times people were fearful when they saw an angel. I'm sure we all would be too. But that passage, or the part where he says, fear gripped him. Can you understand a little better why the fear gripped him? He walks in, sees an angel on the right side. He thinks, that's it, I'm dead. I messed up. What could I possibly have done wrong here? Am I going to make it to paradise or am I going to torment? That's probably the last thing he was thinking before the angel continued. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. Now, let's look a little closer at these names here because a very important part of when I read scripture, I always remember that words mean things and they have definite meanings. So Zacharias, the father means Yahweh remembers. Right? And Elizabeth, the name of her me name is Oath of God. So when you put these together, you have Yahweh remembers oath of God. Well, what oath could he be remembering right before the Messiah is born? He's remembering the new covenant, which he said would come in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And then if we look at the name of John, is Yahweh is gracious. We put these two thoughts together just from the names these three names of this family, we see that Yahweh remembered his oath and he's going to be gracious. And we understand that today as the new covenant has come through the death and resurrection of Messiah and we are living under grace. We're no longer under the law. So I had heard that teaching and I think that was very, very deep and very great. So I thought, well, I want to go and do the same thing with the names Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. So Jesus, or Yeshua, is Yahweh is salvation. 
And there's some pretty cool word plays in Hebrew as you read through the Gospels that we don't really see because we're reading them in English. One is when the angel is speaking to Joseph in Matthew 1, 21. And the angel says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, or Yahweh is salvation, for he will save his people from their sin. Another very interesting example of this is when Jesus was going to be circumcised. Now, in the first century, the babies did not get their names until the actual ceremony of circumcision. And most of the time, the only people that knew the names were the mother and father. But as they walked towards the temple, there was a man there there named Simeon, and this is what he says in Luke 2.30. For my eyes have seen your salvation. He was talking to the Lord. Now, we don't really see that in English, but what what he was saying in Hebrew was, for my eyes have seen Yeshua, and his name is Yeshua. So Simeon is being a prophet, prophesying the name or what's going to happen through this child without even knowing what his name is. So I looked into Joseph, and Joseph is the same name as the person in the Old Testament, and that means Yahweh has added. So I stopped right there and I got really excited. I'm like, this is so cool. With Messiah coming, Yahweh has added. He's added something great. He's added love. He's added peace. He's added contentment. He's added union with God. I don't know. Let's, let's go find it. So I went and found Mary. Now Mary is her English name, basically. When you go from Hebrew to Latin to English, sometimes there's some differences. Mary's name is actually the exact same as Moses' sister in the Old Testament, which is Miriam. And Miriam's name name means rebellion. So when you put that together, you have Yahweh has added rebellion. And I thought, well, I can just stop right here. It doesn't make any sense. That's the last thing I think of when I think of Yeshua or Jesus is being a rebel. But before I just threw it all away, I went and looked at the definition of rebellion, which is opposition to one in authority. And then it started to open up to me. That is exactly what Yeshua came to do, was to be a rebel. The first person, or the first group that he rejected the authority of was the Sadducees and Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. If you look at the way he talks to them, the religious leaders, it's not very nice. He calls them blind guides. He calls them serpents, den of vipers. And yes, the serpent and vipers lead us all back to Genesis chapter three, the fall of man, when the serpent deceived Eve. So he wasn't really getting under their authority and saying, yep, you're the leader, I'm the Messiah, let's do this thing together and bring salvation to the world. No, he, he continually talked down to them, continually um, was just negative towards them because they had lost the relationship in their religion. See, to them, it was all about them and not about God. When he talked about them praying, he said, you pray, you pray out loud in the street for everybody to hear you because you want other people to see how good you are. You know, in my mind, it's almost like they were telling God, see, you should be thankful I'm on your team. Look how good I am. But Jesus doesn't tell us to pray like that. He says to go in to your secret room, go into your closet and pray to your heavenly father because your true prayers, those deep prayers should just be about you and your father and not about what everyone around you is hearing. Now, I looked into the, another uh, person that, may have authority that Jesus may be coming against. And it led me to Satan himself. And some, some terms for Satan in scripture are the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air. The whole world is in the power of the evil one. And we all know, obviously, that Jesus came in rebellion to Satan's authority. 
when I was thinking about the rebellion, a name came to mind of another person whose name actually meant rebellion in Scripture, and, and the one that I found was Nimrod. So I go back to Nimrod, and if you remember, he was definitely a rebellious person. When Noah and, and his sons and their wives got off of the ark, the first thing God said was spread out, multiply. Make your little kingdoms and there will be government, but stay separate, spread out, cover the whole world. Well, Nimrod comes along and is, is king of Babel or king of Babylon. It's the same word in Hebrew. And he decided, I don't want to do what God wants us to do. I want to be an emperor. I want to be a king over many king, kingdoms. So he sets up many cities and he is the ruler over these many cities. He's the emperor. And then he decided, well, we're going to build a Tower of Babel and we're going to worship God our way. Not the way he wants us to, but our way. And God gets very upset with this. And in Deuteronomy 32, 8, God gets really fed up. And it says that he divided them. And as he divided their languages, he put them other, under other gods. Now we know that we serve the one true God, the Most High. So these other gods are just other heavenly beings that he put them under. And as he put them under them, I can see God saying like a lot of parents do, when my kids just keep coming to me and keep asking questions to do stuff that I know is not right for them or, or not going to be beneficial, maybe they'll get hurt, maybe something bad will come from it. After a while, just to teach them a lesson, lesson I say, fine, you want it, you got it, go get it and suffer the consequences. Because sometimes in life, those consequences that we suffer we learn more and more in depth about what we did wrong than just being told not to do it. Well, here God says, fine, you wanna serve these other gods, these, these other heavenly beings? Fine, you want it, you got it. And he divided the nations and put them under these other beings. Now in your translations of uh, Deuteronomy 32.8, it may say that it's divided according to the sons of Israel. But the older manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls says God's there. So he did that. And God steps back and lets mankind kind of go its own way. But very quickly, then God says, I'm going to call this man Abram. And I'm going to call his wife Sarah. And I'm going to make them into a group. And I'm going to miraculously do it because Sarah's barren. And no one can say that they did it on their own, but that Yahweh himself has given them children. And one of the first promises he makes to Abraham is, through one of your descendants, the whole world will be blessed. And we know him to be Yeshua, Jesus today. And he did come to bless every person. Bless is in the sense to offer salvation in a new way. Before Jesus, there was true salvation for anyone, but you had to actually go and become an Israelite through a process. You, you gave up your old citizenship and you became an Israelite. You accepted both citizenship and the religion and you served Yahweh. But Jesus comes to make it a different way. And when he does come, very quickly in his ministry, you can see that he starts to push against the authority of Satan and his demons. Many times he goes up to individuals and he's casting out demons. And, and those people accept him as the Messiah. And in my mind, that's that single person coming out from under the authority of Satan and back under the authority of Yahweh. And he's taking people one at a time, going from one side to the other. And he does this many times, in many ways, he's taking back people for Yahweh. And this all culminates at the Mount of Transfiguration. As Messiah goes up and he unveils himself to be the true Messiah. And he does it in a very wicked place where idol worship had happened for centuries before and happens, happened for centuries after. But he goes to the demonic realm and he says, I'm here. I'm in contradiction to your authority. I'm taking back what is rightfully God's. And from that point, many more events happen in his life, but it's all headed towards Jerusalem and the cross. After the cross, he's resurrected. 
He appears to disciples and many other people for about 40 days. And one of the, one of the last things he tells them before he ascends is he gives them the Great Commission. He says, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So he's telling them, go do it in my name, because there's power in my name. My name is Yahweh is salvation. And then he tells them, teach them all that I have taught you. So as the disciples move out and fulfill the Great Commission, I hope you can see how areas by individuals coming back to God, Yahweh, parts of the land, parts of the earth are coming back in authority to God. Because once you are a true follower of, of Yahweh, you start to live out his commands. You dedicate your life to him, you dedicate everything you own to him, and he actually has control and authority back over a small part of the earth that was, he had given to Satan much earlier. The next thing Jesus tells those disciples is, go to Jerusalem and wait, I will send the Holy Spirit. And as they're waiting in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, it says the Holy Spirit came down like fires of, uh, like tongues of fire and set upon them. From that point, many miracles happen by the power of the name of Jesus or Yeshua. Recorded in the New Testament, it says people are saved in the name of Jesus. People are healed in the name of Jesus. And demons are cast out in the name of Jesus. Some people believe that that power ended with the apostles, but I can tell you it has not. I have seen people healed in the name of Jesus. David Almeida, right here from our congregation, healed. The doctor doesn't know how it happened. Um, my cousin came out of a coma because people were praying in the name of Jesus. I have seen arguments, violent arguments, ended by praying in the name of Jesus. And I have seen demons silenced by the name of Jesus. It is not gone. It is not for the first century. It is for today. We need to take up the power of the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit and continue to push his authority to more and more people. So I have a question for all of us, and I do include myself in this question. I want to ask you, how is your fire this morning? I remember a commercial on TV many years ago, Smokey the Bear saying, only you can prevent a forest fire. I thought that was really cool. But I wanna turn it around and say this way, only you can allow a fire to be started in yourself. So think about that. What does your fire look like today? Is it just a spark? Or is it a roaring forest fire that is consuming the people around you? Or do you have any fire left in you at all? There are many men that allowed this fire to grow inside of them and go out and consume other people. One is Martin Luther. As Martin Luther was reading through Romans, he read a, a very popular passage, passage that has changed church history. It says, we are saved by grace through faith apart from works. And he couldn't just hold it in. He had to go to the church leaders and say, we've been doing it wrong. It's not about all the works that we're doing here in the church. It's about being saved by grace through faith. And he didn't even know that other men around Europe were thinking the exact same thing. When we think of the Protestant Reformation, we think of Martin Luther, but he did not do it alone but he was willing to stand up and do it alone, even if no one else took the, took the work that God had given them. And it spread and, and it did lead to the Reformation. About 200 years later, another man, John Wesley, in studying scripture realized, we're back to doing religious things and we've really lost that relationship with God. We've lost the thought of what Peter tells us is to be holy as God is holy. And he didn't intend to make a new denomination of, of the Methodist. He just wanted to revive the Church of England. But it turned out to be 
the Methodist Church. Another great awakening of holiness. About 150 years after that, some men got together here in America and said, you know what, we've gotten away from holiness again. It's too much about religion and not about enough about relationship. And they started the Church of the Nazarene. So this is our history. We've seen men in the past stand up and, and be willing to do what God's calling them to do, no matter if anyone was gonna stand with them or not. And I think that's a very important part, point for us today. We need to be willing to stand up and do the work that God has called us to do, whether anyone else will or not. We need to do it at home and start with ourselves and let it spread to our family. We cannot wait for another church or congregation to start the fire. We can't wait for Second Baptist to stand up about some of the new laws here in America and think as soon as they stand up and... and, and um, as soon as they stand up against abortion and other things, we'll stand up with them. We can't wait for new life in Magnolia to make a statement for us to join them. We have to decide individually to fully sell out to the Lord, to fully give him control of our lives and allow him to do what he wants with us. And I guarantee you, just as, as this sermon today, as I was putting this together, I'm listening to what Pastor Steve said, and I was listening to the songs Brandon chose. I turned to Brandy and said, Pastor Steve's already hit all my major points. But the Holy Spirit put it all together. If he can do that for a single service today, he can do it in a wide evangelistic movement that will move across the United States. We don't have to think about saving every person in America, though. It goes all the way back to the Great Commission to let your light shine so that one person comes to Christ. That's one more person that's coming out from under the authority of Satan and into the kingdom of God. And Jesus, Yeshua, whichever word you want to say, I believe Satan hears the same thing when we say that. He hears Yahweh is salvation. And it comes directly against his authority. Now, I'm going to play one song here at the end. And I just want you to think about that, about how is your fire. If you've never experienced that fire and never experienced the salvation of Jesus, I invite you to come to the altars during the song. If you're ready to take another step and go from just salvation to a life where Jesus is truly your master and your Lord, come and make that dedication. I invite you to do that. If you need to stay here longer than the song, take as long as you need for the Lord to deal with you in the way he wants to deal with you. Because the only hope for this world is for, for believers to realize that the Holy Spirit wants to work through us, but we still have free will. We have to allow him to work through us.